and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm going to be joined by Nancy Davis, right, um, from Quadratic Capital. Really excited to have you on and uh, learn a little bit more about your story. So thanks for joining us today, Nancy. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Great to be here. Um, so uh, g get a couple of things out of the way early on. Uh, the first one's always just, can you give me the 15 or 20 seconds of who you are and what you do in case anyone uh, here doesn't know you that's listening? Sure. Um, I'm a uh, fixed income manager. Uh, I manage the IVOL ETF. Um, it's an inflation uh, protection uh, treasury fund plus uh, interest rate options. So it's pretty different. And um, I'm also the founder of Quadratic, which I affirm that I founded in 2013. Awesome. That's, uh, you know, so those, those are two pretty important things. <laughs> but well, well, yeah. Which one do you, which one excites you more? Like if you could only pick one then, what, what would you do? <laughs> well, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg, right? I couldn't have yeah. one without the other, <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They both are very, very fascinating and uh, something I'm uh, my little babies, <laughs> both of them. Awesome. Well, well, I'll push on that more later. Maybe maybe there is an answer, right? You know, <laughs> the chicken or the egg. We don't know yet. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the so the next thing is kind of two icebreaker questions I always love to start with. Uh, the first one is really just food. So what's your favorite thing about food? food, whether it would be favorite style of food, last meal, culturally about food, um, you know, love to just hear uh, whatever that is uh, that, that kind of speaks to you. Well, I love all food. <laughs> I guess I'll start there. Um, I probably, um, my eating habits are probably a little bit more like a teenage boy. Um, you know, I tend to like you know, Chick-fil-A is one of my, you know, all-time favorite go-tos. I like Taco Bell. Um, I am <laughs> do like uh, fancy food as well, but I'm uh, I'm pretty, I enjoy it all. So I'm, uh, I like food. How about you, Jamie? So, What's your favorite food? Well, uh, so, so I'm, I'm actually like a big cheeseburger person. So that's definitely one. I love Chick-fil-A. Uh, I do. So, I mean, I'm a... Uh, I, maybe one day I'll eat less of it, but uh, I still tend to order like the number one plus a 12 piece. So that's like my go to order. Um, mm -hmm. What do you have a go to order when you go there? Or? Yeah, I do. Actually, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> and it's it's I get a lot. I I should be embarrassed, but I am. Um, I always get the mac and cheese because I love it. And then I ask for like the cheese top. I don't like just the like just the noodles and the sauce. I like the cheese on top as yeah. well. So I, uh, and then I usually get the chicken nuggets, which is, um, I usually get the 30 piece, which is pretty big, but I'll eat it in, you know, a couple sit downs. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Multiple phases of 30 nuggets. Yeah. yeah. Phases. <laughs> it starts in the car, right? As soon as I get them, right? Cause they're easy to eat and drive. <laughs> but We go from there. <laughs> Yeah, that, I used to, so in college, you know, funny story about nuggets is they, I don't know that they, I don't think they still have it. Maybe they do, but um, McDonald's used to have like a nugget bucket and you, I think it was like 50 nuggets. And so I always used to order this like nugget bucket at uh, McDonald's, but I don't, I don't think I see it on menus. I mean, you could obviously get 50 nuggets, but it doesn't come in a big bucket anymore, which was, yeah. you know, half the fun of it. <laughs> well, the, the Chick-fil-A one comes in a, big box so it's kind of like a trough you know it's like a huge big cardboard <laughs> box so it's kind of not as guilty as a bucket but close <laughs> so. yeah i like it i like how you described it as a trough though, right you're like you know yeah it's just eating out of this trough of nuggets uh well, uh, we'll go to the next one. So the next question is, uh, you know, again, kind of a personal one, right? But it's a little bit different. And a lot of advisors, financial professionals tend to ask clients this. And I, I thought, you know, it's such a great question. So I'm going to flip the script and ask people when they come on the show, which is what was your first memory of money? Um, positive, negative, you know, abundance, scarcity, like what, what immediately pops to mind? Oh, gosh. Um... This is probably a little out there, but my, um, I think the first time I really understood money was, uh, with my mother. Um, she is, she's, a she's now retired, but at the time she was a, uh, 
school teacher and um, she had received I think my my grandfather had passed and had left a little bit of money to her and she promptly went out and spent it all on Persian carpets um, mm -hmm. you know it's uh, and I remember being a small I mean I think I was probably like seven eight years old and I remember being concerned about her buying you know like I don't know like four or five Persian carpets with all of her inheritance from her father and uh, we actually, I convinced her to take them back to the store and they of course were like no refunds, but me as my little, you know, blonde, uh, you know, uh, I guess my personality was shining even when I was, you know, six or seven, I was able to convince them that she really shouldn't have spent all of her money on these Persian carpets and should, you know, just get one and keep the rest of the money. <laughs> so that's probably my first memory of really understanding money well i feel like that's a pretty deep story <laughs> know, there's probably a lot oh. there to unpack but yeah i mean i don't think very many like six seven eight year olds probably grasp that right like <laughs> that there is this like huge financial connection between buying and that we should return them and I mean, I, I mean, was that just how your mind worked or was that, you know, instilled from some other source as a child? Um, I, I don't know. I think sometimes it's more out of, you know, I think my mom being a school teacher just didn't have a very good sense of money. And when she came into a lot of money, she just spent it all um, pretty much, you know, immediately, especially on like who needs, you know, six or seven Persian rugs, right? It's like at some point you're like, okay, get one nice one. But I don't know, maybe it was, um, maybe it was uh, because of that need or maybe it was just me. I'm not sure. Again, chicken or egg, you don't know, is it nature or is it nurture? But that was one of my earliest memories of learning about money and also about spending versus saving. Yeah. And so, I mean, did your mom save that additional money or did it get spent on something else? She spent it on something else. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, better, or, better or worse than per, like having seven Persian rugs? Well, probably better because nothing against okay. Persian rugs, but it's always good to have uh, different financial assets and diversify like everything in life, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what was uh so i feel like this will probably impact <laughs> right some of your world view on money as you kind of move throughout but well, what was your first job do you remember like did you have like small jobs or kind of like a first like you know working at a restaurant something like that what was your first uh, job um you know i definitely did small jobs when i was a child like you know i was always trying to uh, you know, I think I had the entrepreneurial strike really, uh, the, the, that streak really early, um, whether it was uh, babysitting jobs or pet sitting jobs. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I got to college, I did have like real jobs. Um, I, uh, I worked at a management consulting firm. Um, I was actually full time. Uh, for my last couple of years of college, I think two or three years where I worked there full time, like 40 hours a week. And I loved it. Um, it really helped me uh, with what I do now. Um, it got me because of my, uh, we were doing transfer pricing, which is, uh, uh, I guess, a pretty esoteric part of management consulting, but it's essentially taking revenue from one high tax country and swapping it to a potentially lower tax country and that all involved swaps and derivatives and so i got pretty interested in derivatives when i was in college because of my job um and i ended up taking i think five grad classes as an undergrad and uh it definitely paved the way for what i do now so i'm grateful uh, for that that early uh internship slash job well, like in high school, did you know you wanted to go like manage uh, <laughs> portfolios and fixed income? And <laughs> probably not. But uh, no, I, what did you think? Yeah. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? 
I don't think I was really thinking about it in high school. <laughs> um, I uh, I didn't come from, you know, I guess, starting this uh, conversation with the Persian carpet story. You know, my parents were not uh, Wall Street people. They didn't. I they weren't involved in finance. I didn't really see any of that uh, going about my day to day life. Um, I got interested in the derivative markets uh, from my first job. And then uh, when I was a college student, then I started trading options myself, which I love to do. So I kind of, I guess, fell into it. But um, it's not like I, you know, if you asked, you know, 15 year old me, uh, what would you do? It probably being a fixed income portfolio manager uh, was not anywhere on the radar <laughs> at that point. Yeah, well, well where where'd you go to college? I went to college in Washington D.C. at George Washington. And uh, so, like, did you get that uh, kind of first job internship? You said you were kind of working there full time by l later college at the consulting firm. Did that come through the school? Did it come like how did you kind of land there um, into that role? Um, so the great thing about going to school in Washington, D.C. is there were lots of businesses in the area. So I, um, it wasn't related to school, but because I was going to school in the city, there were lots of companies and businesses. And so I applied for an internship and, um, you know, really clicked with the, the team and was somebody who really liked uh, sinking my teeth into projects and then they kept uh, giving me more hours, and I ended up taking, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, evening classes, which was great because a lot of the professors were adjunct, and a lot of them happened to be, you know, previous professionals, and that's where I learned about investing in Wall Street was from uh, some of those grad classes that I took with um, adjunct professors. Shout out to Dick Scaldini. You know who you are. <laughs> So, so is that the, it, it, it was uh, Dick Scalgini's class one that really reshaped kind of your view on things? Was that an important one? Yeah, that was definitely a really <laughs> important one. Um, he was a former uh, banker from, I believe, Credit Suisse and had been involved with the, uh, the LBO um, of RJR Nabisco. And I just thought it was super fascinating and taught me a lot about derivative markets, capital markets. Um, it was a business school class. I was very fortunate to be um, a presidential academic scholarship kid. So a, uh, some of my education you know, was paid for. It was a, a financial scholarship, but B, and probably even more beneficial, was as an undergrad, I could take classes in any of the universities. So it wasn't like I was stuck in, you know, one school and had to take just those classes so i was able to take you know all sorts of different lines of within the university and um the business school grad classes were at my at my reach which was pretty unusual as an undergrad so i'm grateful for uh that program and that opportunity did, did you finish up in like the was that mba program did you finish that up at some point I was just an undergrad just taking grad classes, so it wasn't a, I wasn't a grad student there. It was just when I was an undergrad. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, what did you do after you graduated? So, uh, you know, we finished up school at GW. Did you stay in D.C. for a while? No, not at all. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I love D.C. I would have loved to stay uh, in the area. It's a great city. But I, um, I was really interested in, uh, in the financial markets, and there weren't many um, opportunities in that area for finance. And so I moved to New York City uh, to work for Goldman Sachs. Okay. And what was it? What, uh, what year did you start at Goldman? It was 1998. Okay. And that, how long did you stay at Goldman? <laughs> Uh, about a decade. Okay. Well, I, I'd love to, I mean, so what was Goldman like when you went in in 98, <laughs> right? Versus maybe when you, did you leave in two, uh, around 2008 then? Yes, exactly. Okay. 
Um, well, I'd love to hear about that, right? Because that's a pretty interesting time period, probably, <laughs> to be in Goldman, right? Oh, it was an amazing time. Um, when I joined, Goldman was still a partnership. It was before the firm had gone public. Um, so it was still privately held with partners. And I think coming from that culture of um, partnership was so important for my um, early days and seeing what made the firm work and how successful they were with um, with having uh, that partnership mentality was super, uh, super important for me. And uh, what was your what was your first kind of like, you know, what were you working on when you first got there? Um, so I was uh, I was doing a lot with derivative uh, markets and um, you know, it was a, a really exciting time. Uh, I was very fortunate to um, join the prop group. Um, that's a bit of a dinosaur because those teams don't exist anymore, but it was just a great opportunity for me to look at uh, investing across asset classes and really helping me with what later became uh, quadratic. So it was, it was an amazing opportunity and I felt very fortunate to be there. What was the um, what was kind of the experience going through? I guess kind of the the tech bubble there during that time period too, right? I mean, uh, how impacted were you, or like what did you kind of did you learn much from that experience during that time too? Yeah, it was a obviously a really really wild time. I think even before the tech bubble, I think one thing that was very formative to my career was long term capital blowing up. Um, they uh, were sellers of um, convexity, sellers of volatility. And I think seeing kind of that whole thing implode really helped shape uh, what later became uh, my investing philosophy, which is having, you know, uh, long optionality. So you know, you know what your losses can be. They're, you know, fully funded uh, long options. So you have an asymmetric potential payout but define downside. And so I think long-term capital was probably uh, very, very important um, as a uh, as a young trader to see that. So you kind of mentioned there, right, that that was probably impactful for your long-term kind of investing mission or view. I mean, uh, uh, and so go into that a little bit, right? Like what what is kind of the view you have and, you know, why is it a little bit different? And I'd, I'd love to just hear about that formation and how, it's, you know, your mind's changed on that a little bit over time, if at all, well, <laughs> right? Like it, I guess it, it probably has, right, uh, developed. And uh, But I'd love to just kind of, you know, what was the development of this kind of investing philosophy? Well, I think um, most portfolio managers, uh, even today, create a portfolio and then they risk manage it, right? And most people risk manage with the use of, say, stop losses, right? How, how often, Jamie, do you have people who come on your show and they talk about risk management and stop losses and mitigating risk? Do you hear that a lot? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about <laughs> most strategies, right? Uh, I th I'd say most people right in the risk management space probably do go to risk mitigation, right? Um, versus like risk avoidance, right? Is not typically in the investment side too big of a strategy, but uh, mitigation is definitely a, a large one. Right. And so I guess our philosophy at Quadratic is a little bit different because I think it's, it's like, you know, remember when you were learning math in, uh, you know, whatever in school, and you would look at an equation, right? And they would have, you know, maybe it would start with addition or subtraction, and then later you would get into, you know, say division or multiplication. You had to do the order of operation, right? You, it wasn't where the equation started. It was what, what do you do first? Um, and I personally think a lot of, you know, more conventional investing strategies just have the wrong order of operation when constructing risk because the concept of stop losses to me you know seems all backwards right it's like first you lose money and then only after you've lost money do you start to manage risks that seems like the wrong order um of operation and so 
what we like to do is we construct portfolios using long options, right? So when you buy an option, very simply, there's never an obligation on the fund above and beyond the premium that you pay, right? So it's a fully funded long option. And then, uh, and you know what you can lose. And then you have an asymmetric potential uh, payout. And then it's really about taking profits instead of Instead of managing losses, it's about profit taking. So it's just a different way of constructing portfolios. But I think it makes a lot more sense, right? Um, and you know, maybe it's a pretty simplistic way to think about it. But I think it's a different way of constructing portfolios. But I think in a lot of ways better uh, potentially for investors. Yeah, I, I like the example that you gave uh, too, like the simple one of uh, kind of looking at the order of operations, right? And, you know, thinking back from what actually makes sense to put first, uh, you know, not just how it's laid out. And I think that's a, a really good analogy. Um, when you look at the term risk, right? When you hear risk, how do you tend to define risk, right? Because I think that's a fun conversation too, because to some degree, right? That's if we had this, you know, uh, equation and we had a variable in there and it was risk, right? Um, what do we mean by risk and how do you tend to look at risk? And, and we'll, you know, narrow it down a little bit, but it, in the kind of investment, you know, portfolio management world, how would you define risk? Like, what do you think about there? Yeah, I think I'm pretty black and white about ri what risk is um, because our risk is um, defined at least with the options portion of the portfolio with the market value, the premium that we pay for the option, and then the treasuries that we use. Some people think of U.S. treasuries as risk-free. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I think the treasuries have a lot of risk, um, but at least with the options, we know what our risk is. Um, so I think we definitely think about it in a different way. I think a lot of people look at risk based on the um, historical standard deviation of the strategy but to me you know that's that's just what taught what happened in the past right and i think the one thing we can all count on whatever the next event in the markets is going to be i think it's unlikely to be the thing that everybody's worried about right because when everybody's aware and worried about one thing, it typically isn't a big deal or, <laughs> you know, something that's on everyone's radar. Um, whereas other things like, let's just talk about a global pandemic, like who would have, uh, who would have known that that was coming in, say, you know, if, if you were, you know, I don't know, pick it fall 2019 before the virus had really, you know, started, that wasn't a risk that a lot of people were, you know, circling on their calendar for 2020, but it was, you know, what what everybody was dealing with in 2020. Well, you brought up in there that uh, when you look at, um, you know, you know, federal treasuries, right? Um, you don't see those as risk free, as a lot of people put them into those categories. Uh, describe that. Like, how do? You, what's your view, kind of on 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 the Fed on that side? And I, I'd love to hear, right? Like, what risk do you see inside of that today? Well, I think all all investing involves risk, right? So I think it's just a question of how much risk you're taking. Some people consider, uh, you know, the ten year Treasury as a risk free uh, measure. Um, you know, look at the ten year this year. You know, it's down. Uh, you know, double digits. So I think it's kind of a flawed measure in the model to say the 10 year is a risk free rate. Um, I think all investing involves risk and treasuries are in the fixed income side of the equation. I think treasuries are, you know, a lot better than other types of bonds, right? A lot of people use uh, things with corporate credit spread for their bond exposure to get that kick over governments. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, like simple example, if you own Apple stock and Apple bonds and Apple has a management company issue or a product issue or a sector issue, you kind of have, you know, it, it, it's still a dog, right? It, it might have less of a bark, but it's still, you know, credit and equities um, are kind of the same thing because it's all corporate risk. 
are you seeing today a lot of people try to chase that you know kind of yield or return or kick as you said on the corporate you know credit or bond side because you know the 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 fed treasury side right has been so bad for a while now in the sense of returns over maybe inflation that you know most of the, i think most of the real rates right at the beginning of the year were probably negative uh, they might still be today and uh you know kind of project it out so yeah what are you kind of seeing on that side yeah i do think investors have to be very aware of what they own especially in their fixed income side of the portfolio like you um you need to know credit spreads are more risky than government bonds and credit spreads tend to widen meaning bond prices going lower when equities sell off so you have to you know if you want to have a diversified portfolio, but you're mostly in uh, things with corporate credit risk, it, you know, look at what happened in March 2020, credit sold off right along with equities, which makes sense. Um, most of the time credit spreads do widen when equities sell off. So I think it's just super important for investors to know what you own. And, you know, I think it's especially um, uh, hard because many investors own short duration because they think it's less risky than things with longer duration and short duration is a bit of a i think it's a bit of a misnamed strategy because it's still you know it's still long duration right it's just really should be called less long right it still will mathematically lose money when interest rates move higher short duration is still long duration so mathematically it will still lose in price terms and then a lot of short duration strategies to get that kind of kick in um, yield, it takes, they tend to take a lot of credit spread risk. So you have to be really careful um, with what you own uh, to make sure that your, you know, your fixed income does, uh, is more likely to diversify your equity portfolio. So I would just be very careful of, um, what's inside you can't just go based off of fund name you actually have to look and see what's inside uh the strategy whether it's active or passive well i'll pull us back in time again a little bit i think that was a fun deviation and uh to hear more just about how you kind of view the the markets and um so when what prompted you i guess to leave um you know in 2008 ish I was recruited um, to uh, what at the time was the world's largest hedge fund. Um, I joined uh, JP Morgan's hedge fund. I was a portfolio manager there, and it was really just a personal um, reason that I left Goldman. I, I love the firm. I love my role. I had been the head of credit derivatives and OTC trading for the prop team for, you know, I, I think I had been the head of that group uh, for probably five years at that point. Um, I was very happy there. It was really just personal um, that I had, uh, you know, a family at that point and I had moved out to Connecticut and uh, I was commuting, you know, three and a half, four hours a day to get to Lower Manhattan where Goldman is headquartered. And it was just a very long commute. And when I was recruited out by uh, this hedge fund, they offered to open a Greenwich office for me so I didn't have to commute anymore. And that was, you know, it wasn't like I was looking for uh, a different group of people or a different job, but having that flexibility, I think that's one of the great things about the pandemic. Like one silver lining we can all take away is potentially it'll give, um, especially women who are mothers, a little bit more flexibility because spending you know, four hours a day commuting was probably not necessary um, or the best use of time. Uh, but that was that was why I left was just the commute. Yeah, I mean, that's a interesting. So did you how many kids did you have at that point? Uh, two. Two. And uh, I mean, did you <laughs> like, did you ever have that conversation there? Did you just not feel comfortable having it? Right. Was the culture just people don't work from home part-time or whatever at that point? Well, so I was a, um, 
investing Goldman's capital. It was all proprietary trading, so we had no clients. Um, we actually, I did feel comfortable bringing it up with the firm, and we did talk about it. But uh, I would, working from home, I would literally have to have like a Goldman Sachs sign in my home <laughs> window, and compliance could have at any point come and you know come into my house. It wasn't really Done an audit. <laughs> yeah possible to uh, without making my home an office. Um, but I think now, I, I don't know the rules at different Wall Street firms, but I think everybody obviously has been forced to work from home. So I imagine there's more flexibility. But I did, we did talk about it um, and uh, did look into it, but kind of the compliance burdens of maybe it was because I was in prop trading and investing Goldman's capital, but it, and that doesn't even exist anymore, really, since the financial crisis, but it wasn't, it wasn't a possibility, but I did feel comfortable raising it. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, like, did you feel, I mean, I guess, you know, that, that ended up, you know, it sounds like it ended up well, and you, you made a good decision. I mean, like, how hard do you think that is for, for that position, though, being a working mom? Like, was that, like, was that really the biggest driver? And, and did you get more time with your kids and more balance, per se, after the change? Or it just kept moving? <laughs> yeah, no, I do think, um, you know, you're able to be not having that commute. You're, you know, there are a lot of productive things that you could do during the commute. Like, I was always very well read. Um, I spent my time, you know, kind of by the time I got to the office, I knew you know, what had happened uh, overnight in Asia, what was going on in Europe. And so it was a very productive time, but at the same time it was, you know, a lot of, you know, drive uh, to the train station, wait for the train, take the train into Grand Central, <laughs> then take the subway downtown. You know, it's a lot of, it was one of those things that I had done it for, you know, five years or so, um, never really thought much of it. But once you stop doing that, you're like, oh my gosh, how did I, how did I do that for, you know, every day, five days a week for so long? Um, so it was definitely a, you know, I think the right decision for my family. And um, I hope that the pandemic can have that silver lining where uh, more, you know, whether you're you know, whatever type of couple, I think for couples generally, men and women to have more, uh, more time uh, with the family, more productive time with work and less time commuting, I think it'll be one of the great positives from this whole experience. Yeah, I, I hope some of that balance stays out there. Um, so it obviously went to the hedge fund for what, about five years, four or five years, and then uh, you go out and you start um, Quadratic. So I'd love to hear, like, what was your why behind starting the firm and, you know, uh, going out and doing your own thing? Well, I, I founded Quadratic in 2013. Um, I was very excited to, I always had the same kind of investing philosophy of having that define downside and stop lossing uh, when we construct portfolios using options. And it's really differentiated. It's a different way of constructing portfolios. And I just thought, you know, I really believed in what we were doing. And I thought it would be a, a great experience to create my own firm and start it. I think coming up with the name was hard. I think uh, a lot of people name their firms after themselves or the street that they grew up in or you know there's so many asset managers that are a combination of colors and geographies right or colors and trees or you know <laughs> uh, mountains uh, and so I did spend I did struggle for a little bit trying to figure out a name that would not be um, you know arrogant or egotistical with my name in it um, and really build you know I want to build a team and something that outlives me as a firm. Uh, so I didn't want to put my name on it, but I thought Quadratic was a great name because it's from my love of algebraic equations and, you know, the quadratic equation, if you graph it, you know, it's that, that convex payout, that, that smile. And so I thought, what a fun name and trademarked it. Um, it's a registered trademark and, uh, got the firm going so it's been uh 
it's been just absolutely a pleasure. I've loved it from, you know, day one. When did you know that you were going to start your own firm? Like, was there a moment, I mean, that you were like, you know what, I've got to go do it. Did something <laughs> trigger that or <laughs> how did you get there? Um, you know, I think I definitely thought about it for many years and um, it's, it's hard when you're starting your own firm because it's kind of, you know, it's really a leap of faith. It's a huge bet on yourself because you go from being, you know, think about it, you get paid to work. And when you create a firm, you're actually paying to work, right? So it's really a mentality switch and thinking it, of it as like an investment in myself. Um, it took a, you know, it took a lot of courage to do that um, and a lot of belief in you know, what we do and what we were able to offer. But it, it's definitely hard to, you know, to leave behind um, something, you know, like a job is pretty safe, right? And starting a firm is pretty risky and a job you get paid. And when you start a firm, you're not getting paid at all. You're actually paying people and you have expenses. So it was, um, I remember in the early days, people would ask me about, our operating capital. And I always felt like that was a bit of a oxymoron because I was like, you, you know, there is no, like, there's no revenue, there's no clients, <laughs> there's no, any, you just mean my personal bank account, right? Because I was literally taking money from my personal account and wiring it to our management company to spend it within uh, the business. So it was a bit of a, a euphemism for my, you know, what amount of my life savings am I willing to put into starting this business? And, uh, but I, I, I encourage everybody who's ever thought about starting their own firm and starting a business, no matter what industry it's in, whether it's, you know, in finance or if you want to make dog shampoo, I'm just thinking of random things, you know, whatever it is that you like to do, I think it's definitely the American dream to try to do it for yourself. You know, I, I felt like I was exceptionally good at this type of investing. I, you know, I, I thought I was probably one of the best in the world and why shouldn't I do it for myself um because I believed in it and and so the, how's the firm kind of grown and developed since you launched it right so I mean obviously you've done well now what is it uh we're eight ish years into it so congratulations on that right <laughs> like you put your money into it and uh you know, it, it continues to move forward. So tell us a little bit more about that. Then obviously, um, as you kind of said, uh, the, you know, uh, the other things that have developed around it now over the last eight years. Well, I think the big evolution that we had was um, exploring other wrappers uh, for our strategy. And we actually listed um, the eyeball ETF in May 2019 and I think that was a very courageous thing to do because there wasn't another ETF that already did that um, mm -hmm. that type of strategy and for me it was just one of those you know feel good things that we wanted to um, give you know we really wanted a better wrapper for our strategy it's fully transparent so investors know what they own um, the fees are much lower than a private fund. There's no incentive fee and the management fee is lower, um, which is good for our investors. And it also has, um, you know, liquidity, which is inside many private funds. It's kind of, I think, something that's going to go away personally, because think about how crazy it is. If you have a bunch of public securities, why would you ever put it inside of a private fund wrapper, right? You're kind of creating a mismatch between, you know, public securities, private fund. I think it makes a lot more sense for investors to have public securities being inside of a public fund. But a lot of managers don't want to do that because it takes away, you know, it's essentially the compensation scheme of having uh, the assets locked up, even if it's quarterly or annually liquidity, plus having higher fees. So I'm really proud of the, I think it took a lot of courage to break out of that mold and to do something that was, you know, I, I see quadratic as, you know, the, you know, I think of low fees and ETFs as Vanguard, right? And I see 
quadratic as the uh, the vanguard of convexity, right? The low cost provider of uh, of convexity solutions. I like that. So, uh, how was the <laughs> Uh, how was like the SEC process going through to to register and get the ETF up? Was that like strenuous and difficult, or did it go fairly smoothly for you? <laughs> well, I I had obviously never had a uh, mutual fund board or trust or any of those things. It wasn't something I knew about, and so I think with any you know as you're building any business, there are always two approaches you can build it or partner and or buy it. And so I decided to partner with the experienced um, and well-established uh, firm that issued ETFs. So all of those things were sort of, um, I don't want to say plug and play, but it wasn't something I had to do for the first time or try to figure out on my own because as a portfolio manager, what I bring to the table is on the investment side not necessarily, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, all of the, all of the things around an ETF. It's a 40 act fund. It needs to have a trust. You know, there's a lot of operational infrastructure involved, and so we were very fortunate to have a great partner um, to start uh, the ETF with. Well, I like that lesson, right? That's a good lesson, right? It's kind of it may, maybe a little bit more nuanced than you than you even you said it, but it's kind of the know what you're really good at, focus on that, right? And then, right, partner in the other areas if you don't have the experience or kind of strength in there. Um, how did you pick the right partners? I mean, have like what's been the maybe the work? Have you made a really bad decision with partnering with anyone yet? So, I guess that's always a good question. Well, I think um, I had a little bit of a different approach about how we picked our partner. Um, and it really goes back to my days at Goldman. Um, for a lot of my time at Goldman, um, Hank Paulson was the CEO of the firm. He later went on to become the Treasury Secretary during the financial crisis. And looking back, you know, I'd say he had really three passions. Um, you know, personally, I'm talking not not firm wise, and you know, he uh, he loved birds. Uh, he was big into bird watching. I don't know if you uh, knew that about him. He was a very devout uh, Christian scientist, and third, he loved China. Um, so I had the um, great opportunity to go to mainland China. My first time, I think, was 2003 when I was with Goldman and visiting Beijing and kind of seeing the growth that was taking place um, in the country. And so I think it all kind of goes back to those uh, early days at Goldman, learning about China. And um, when I wanted to create uh, the Eyeball Fund, to me, it's an access product. It, it provides access to the uh, inflation and interest rate markets. It's you know, interest rate markets are some of the biggest markets in the world. But in the ETF universe, most people just slice and dice equities or, you know, cre things with credit spread, right? Like high yield bonds or levered loans or, you know, investment grade. There's not really that much in the rates market. And so we partnered with a firm that had really been focused on delivering uh, access to Chinese markets to U.S. investors. And I was like, that makes so much sense for us because we're giving access to inflation and interest rate markets. So it was probably a bit of a, a bold decision to have, you know, a Chinese partner. But I also thought, you know, what better partner than China for a fund that is mostly U.S. treasuries? I mean, they're one of the biggest owners of treasuries in the world is China. So it's worked out really well. But I think um, it was probably not the conventional route to take. Yeah, you're right. You're probably not the conventional or, you know, maybe even safest uh, route to take. But, well, uh, I know just being cognizant of time and looking at everything, I'll, I'll get to kind of the last-ish question, which is uh, the if you're going to pass on, and I, I always reword this one differently every time, but if you're going to pass on, like, maybe a, a trait or characteristic of value to your kids, uh, what do you think that would be? Like, what would you want to make sure that they had that you've learned? Well, I always say um, to my children, as well as to um, 
when I teach at, uh, I volunteer for a lot of universities in the financial engineering program or MBA programs. And I think, you know, the one thing about your career is you want to find something that you love to do, right? I think it all starts with success comes when, when you love what you do and it doesn't really feel like work and it's something that you would do, you know, for fun in your spare time, if you can try to build your career around doing something you love, I think that is the best way to achieve success. And, you know, uh, my partner Crane loves providing access uh, to the China markets and they've really embraced Eyeball for providing access to the rates markets. And I think with any, you know, anything in your life, if you um, do something that you enjoy, that's where you get the most success. Yeah, that's a, a love that. So, um, Nancy, uh, last things are just uh, all the self promotional stuff. So, what's the best way to find you, connect with you, company, all of those things? Um, well, we we have a fund website, which probably is the easiest way to. The nice thing about ETFs is they are fully transparent, and so our materials are listed there. Um, we have a great white paper for financial professionals. Um, that website is uh, the funds ticker. It's I V O L. Sometimes people think I'm saying eyeball, but it's eyeball, <laughs> like inflation, V O L, um, volatility, uh, ETF.com. So it's eyeball ETF.com. Um, or they can go on the Crane's uh, website to also find more information about eyeball. Awesome. And uh, are you active on like LinkedIn or social media or anything yourself? <laughs> Not very. I'm a, I probably should do more, but I don't have a Twitter account. Um, I'm not that active on social media at all. Um, I do have a LinkedIn account, but it's just like, you know, uh, I yeah. don't really <laughs> the basic that one. much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. so I'm not, well, I'm not some social media butterfly, unfortunately, but <laughs> thank you for putting me on your, um, your podcast because maybe this will be the start of it <laughs> yeah. maybe jamie's uh, gonna kick it off for me yeah maybe i mean again go back to your lesson though right if you don't love it then you probably shouldn't do it and i you know for some people social media like you just yeah they don't like it i'm actually you know funny enough i'm not a huge social media person i don't get a lot of enjoyment out of it but i am very active on it so i guess that's a balance of things that's probably the wrong way to be then if you don't enjoy it to do it a lot yeah, it, it feels very much, you know, it's a work thing for me. That's what it feels like. And uh, I, I know it's it's valuable and uh, to, to spend some time on. So I do, but it's not my, you know, if I drew up my favorite thing in the world, it would not be on my top 10 list. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Nancy, uh, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate everything you do. And, uh, you know, obviously you're a brilliant person as it comes to this. And, uh, you know, I'm very impressed by the work you've been able to pull together and do. And, um, yeah, I, I did say, I will tell you, so the, one of the times I was like, uh, well, does she really calling that eyeball? I, I had that same <laughs> thought one, one like time eyeball, too. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> if you come up with like a logo someday later on, maybe you just lean into it and you go with it so you can create an eyeball logo. <laughs> yeah. The logo is just the ticker. So it's, I think our logo yeah. is pretty clear because you can see it's an I like, you know, the letter yeah. me, myself and I not, you know, E Y E. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And for all of our listeners, thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast.